We've got Doug. Uh, Doug Thompson, as many of you know already, he's been on here several times. Doug is a very good dentist. He started the Wellness Dentistry Network. Now, <clears throat> you, once you hear the topic, you might wonder, why do we have a dentist here? The, the formal uh, topic is sh uh, nitric oxide. Should we supplement? The informal topic, more of the clickbait kind of um, kind of top topic is, can mouthwash cause erectile dysfunction? Now, wait, <laughs> wait a minute. We usually don't deal with that stuff on the channel. And what has all that got to do with anything anyway? So just give us a few minutes. Uh, as soon as Carl gives us the water ball, we'll get into the details. So, yeah, you've got a lot of questions that just jump out immediately. For example, uh, nitric oxide, why is it important? Should you supplement? Why is uh, NO or nitric oxide important? Well, it is important. It was the subject of the 1998 Nobel Prize in medicine. What's it got to do with angina, heart attack and stroke? What's it got to do with erectile dysfunction? What does any of that have to do with dentistry or mouthwash? Can mouthwash really cause ED? Um, and there's a subtopic in there too, another subtopic, citrulline and arginine, L-arginine. In fact, as many, many of you know, I hardly ever cover the subject of ED and, it, and it's on purpose. Here's why. Carl, we're getting uh, a Doug, that may be background in your noise on your side. Here's why we reg, rare, rarely cover ED because it is a big, big issue for, especially for men's health and uh, for my population. Um, we haven't covered it in the past. We cover it very little, but we have covered it in a couple of videos. Why do we not focus more on it? Because most men start going down the path of testosterone. Testosterone in most states is a, um, is a controlled substance. So, Yes, we could go there. And yes, it's a major issue for vascular health. But our major focus is vascular health. It's getting involved in, um, in testosterone and controlled substances for a, a telemedicine group like ours is just, at least in the past, would have been a nightmare. Even now, when others are doing it, it still would be a major distraction. We are focused on vascular health. Um, and if you look at our top 10, now part of our top 15 videos, two of them had to do with this specific issue, citrulline and L-arginine. So we're going to answer that for one of that, those questions now. Why citrulline and L-arginine? And why were they so popular? Because they are precursors of nitric oxide. And as we'll learn a little bit more, nitric oxide has a heck of a lot to do with vascular health, and therefore also erectile dysfunction. So back to the 90, uh, 1998 Nobel Prize, it was awarded to three people, Dr. Robert Furchgott, Dr. Louis Ignaro, and Dr. Fareed Murad for their discoveries concerning nitric oxide as a signaling molecule in the cardiovascular system. You see, what it does is it relaxes the smooth muscle in the cardiovascular system. Still not ringing any bells? Well, you'll get there. Um, you remember the intima and the media, you know, in terms of like the intima media space, that's where plaque is laid down. The media is nothing but that smooth muscle. It provides that structure and it's a critical part of blood flow. And you'll see a lot of the ED commercials where they're actually, they don't want to mention ED, so they'll mention blood flow. The intima is the lining. The media is that muscle space. Here's what this research led to. It was a breakthrough in terms of things like nitrates, nitrites, and you remember, may remember the old nitroglycerin for angina. 
here's some pictures if you're not if you're not keying in yet on the smooth the involvement of smooth muscle in our artery walls this dark this black this is a cross section of an artery wall this uh, this layering inside is just dried blood this black area is that intima layer very thin layer this concentric these concentric layers of pink and black and white they are all smooth muscle. Here's a diagram showing the smooth muscle and the intima. And here's some pictures that, if you've seen any of my other videos, they're focused on plaque here. But again, just a reminder, this is the intima, and that's the media, that muscle wall layer. And that's the plaque in between the two. You remember, this is a liquid plaque area. If that liquid plaque breaks through the intima, goes into the bloodstream, touches the blood, it can cause a clot. If the clot's big enough, causes a heart attack. Uh, if it goes to the heart, if it goes to the brain, it causes a stroke. So once you start getting into, um, let's hold on on that one for a second. Once you start getting into the details, what I was going to say is it gets, uh, it gets maybe more interesting than it sounds. But then, obviously, yes, it does, especially uh, uh, for men and for couples. Here's a... Again, a big question. I rarely deal with it on this show because of the focus on um, cardiovascular health. But this was a video, and we're going to talk about where I, how I ran across it. It was actually on the forum. Forum. It's a Dr. Amy Killen, as you see, a young, thin, attractive blonde who's doing a one and a half minute video on is mouthwash ruining your erections. That's not, anyhow, where would, for those of you who have an interest, where would you find that? Again, it's on the forum. And how do you find our forum? First, go to prevmedheartrisk.com. We've got two websites going on right now because we're in a transition. And I can tell you that part's a little bit painful, but it is what it is. Prevmedheartrisk.com slash home dash one. Hopefully we'll clean that up over the next week or so. Go to the upper right hand corner under more and then go to the forum and then search for Houston. We have a problem. If you get to the, uh, the current uh, website homepage, you'll see it in the upper right hand corner more. Click on that and then you go to the forum. And again, you see why um, folks were dealing with this question. Let me go back and read it. It was from Tom Deck. He's a, a super moderator. And again, ED hasn't come up a lot on the forum, but it is, it comes up because of the issue of vascular health. Here's an interesting video I noticed recently. The premise of the video is that bacteria in the mouth play a role in converting the nitrates that we eat ultimately into nitric oxide. You know, if we use mouthwash that kills those bacteria, we lose some potential for nitric oxide production, which ultimately is important for relaxing blood vessels to allow more blood flow to the places where you want it to go. The second reference explains how this conversion happens. So now you're beginning to, uh, to get some of these connections. And obviously, once you understand those connections, you understand what this has to do with vascular health, heart attack, and stroke. So that video that we mentioned is like 51 seconds. We're going to show that, and then we'll go into Doug's presentation about nitric oxide. Carl? There. Did you guys know that mouthwash could be ruining your erections? Um, so nitric oxide is the main chemical messenger that tells your blood vessels to open up. And it's what's responsible for getting blood down into your pelvis so you can have an erection. Well, as you get older, after about the age of 40 or so, you tend to make less and less nitric oxide and you have a harder time converting classic things like L-arginine into nitric oxide. But you can get nitric oxide from food in the form of nitrates, like things like green leafy vegetables, uh, arugula, spinach, beets are very high in nitric oxide. But you need bacteria in your mouth to take the nitrates and make it into nitric oxide. And if you're using mouthwash regularly, you may be killing those bacteria. So 
lay off the mouthwash and uh, maybe you'll see other things perking up. So very interesting, some lighthearted components, but you know, for those of us suffering with the problem, it's uh, maybe not so lighthearted, very serious, but again, uh, not something that we routinely deal with. We focus more on the vascular health side. So this gets back to some of the question of how Doug got involved. Doug had originally asked me about this. There is a group that uh, has a supplement. It's called Neo 40. And uh, they've been approaching Doug and other dentists, especially dentists like Doug, w WDN Dentist, Wellness Dentistry Network docs, because they know that these docs understand nitric oxide. They're all about helping us protect vascular health. So um, the doc, uh, the, uh, the company visited Doug, they visited several other dentists. They said, we've got the greatest thing since sliced bread. Doug did what he often does. He sent that to me and he sent the, the, um, the science. I, that's obviously where I tend to go. I went into the science and Here's a few questions that you should be thinking about as Doug gets into this presentation. Number one, is nitric oxide important? Well, obviously I think we all know that. Here's the biggest question. Number one, should you supplement nitric oxide? And number two, if you do, do you really need to use this or are there other supplements like um, beetroot? Just plain old simple beetroot, five cents a tablet. Is that okay? So Doug, let me hand it off to you. And uh, again, there's gonna be, as you and I have talked, there's probably more uh, more topic than we can cover in, uh, in our routine session today. So we'll cover a little bit. I'll monitor the, uh, the question side and we may have to go into part two. In yeah, that'd, be perfect. That's, that'd be perfect for it, thank you. So I'm going to go back into my share screen. Let me ask you this, uh, Carl, Doug, are you able to see my share, my screen share for Doug's slides? Yep. Okay. Go ahead, Doug. Yeah. So where, you know, where this, where this got started for me, uh, Ford was in the whole idea that gum disease and gum disease causing bacteria can actually affect the, you know, the biology of the, of the blood vessel. And this is what, where this took me. And I had patients asking me, or the current literature was suggesting that periodontal disease could affect erectile dysfunction. And that was a pretty embarrassing question for me. I, I'm thinking I didn't really, wasn't really used to talking about that. Um, so what I learned is that gum disease bacteria affect the endothelium. And I know your audience knows what the endothelium is and how that functions. And you'll see as you go forward and advance the uh, slides there that the, the, they've seen this picture from you before. And this is a picture that describes all the different ways that gum disease bacteria can affect the heart disease process. So part of it's with lipids, part of it's with smooth muscle, part of it's with the endothelium, part of it's with plaque buildup. But you know, there's a multi- dimensional effect that these mouth bacteria have on the system. What I didn't think about was what's the mechanism of action on the endothelium and what happens on the endothelium um, and how do mouth bacteria relate to that. And that's what we'll start to get into. And I also knew that gum disease causing bacteria would affect the different biomarkers that we have uh, available that we can measure. And these are things you measure for when you ask patients to get uh, a pre-consultative workup, if you will. You might ask them to get a HFCRP and you might ask them to get a LPPLA2. I know this is part of your blood panel. And one of the biomarkers that we look at is ADMA. And that's a precursor to nitric oxide. And if, if people have, or it's a, comp it's a competitor for nitric oxide, and if that's elevated in the blood, then I might be suspicious that nitric oxide could be in short supply. If nitric oxide is in short supply, I got to start saying where, how, you know, why is that? And could the mouth be part of that? So we can go ahead and advance. Before, 
Before yep. we do, I'll just do a quick plug for uh, folks. A lot of folks, docs just are not going to get that. As you know, um, the the inflammation, cardiovascular inflammation panel is something that most docs don't know, don't understand, don't know how to order. And um, a quick and easy way to do that is with us. When we have a webinar uh, on uh, insulin resistance where you get something similar. You get a... Um, OGTT with insulin response, similar to the Kraft uh, insulin profile, and you get the cardiovascular inflammation uh, panel. So you get two of the critical studies that, again, docs just don't know how to order. So these are the questions, you know, and I help Dennis try to understand this, you know, what is nitric oxide? But the big one for me is how do we make it? Where do we make it? How do we make it? And then can you measure it? I mean, if you can measure it, then maybe we could do something about it. And then what's the lack of it mean? And that's something forward that you can probably address better than I can. But then what I wanted to know is if you don't have enough, if we don't make it the right way, could you just buy it? I mean, could you just replace it some other easy way? And that's kind of where this is leading, uh, where this is leading to. So as we move ahead and look at what it is, um, it's this signaling molecule that really, uh, does so much in the cardiovascular uh, system. And Ford, you might even be better to deliver this particular slide. But what I wanted to do is digress just a little bit. And I went to the author of this book that wrote this book called Functional Nitric Oxide Nutrition. And I thought if I wanted to find out about nitric oxide, maybe I should go and, and, uh, and you know, see what happens. Your group knows that I've studied a little bit of functional medicine and I was at a functional medicine conference and he got up on the stage and he said, you know, you could be ruining your nitric oxide production if you're using mouthwash. Well, I use very harsh mouth rinses in, in you know, balancing, rebalancing my patient's bacteria levels. Sometimes I have to use really harsh mouth rinses and I'm sitting in the audience and I'm thinking, I do this every day. Am I hurting somebody's ability to make nitric oxide. And that's where this got involved because what he went on to say is that every chronic disease that we deal with starts with the loss of the signaling molecule that does so much great work on the endothelium, keeping the endothelium healthy. And it has a big effect on our body. And the next uh, slide uh, is a little bit of a breakdown where it talks about how important um, the nitric oxide is. And you can go ahead and advance that one. Before, before I'll do that, I'll just comment on item D as in David. The molecule yeah. was only discovered in the late 70s and early 80s, previously called endothelium-derived relaxing factor. That was some of the work that the docs did um, that received that Nobel Prize. That Nobel Prize was covering this work over the past couple of decades. And the reality was it wasn't so much the endothelium relaxing factor because the endothelium can't relax. It's just a, an endothelial. It's a tissue that doesn't, doesn't relax or otherwise. But what does relax is the, um, the media, the smooth muscle that underlies that endothelium. And you saw that in one of our first pictures where that endothelium was all bunched up. It was bunched up because the surrounding um, artery muscle, the surrounding media, the smooth muscle was bunched up and was contracted. Yeah. So in his book, he has this comment about the top 10 causes of death. And, you know, we can see it's heart disease, cancer, respiratory diseases, and we probably won't get to it today, but there is, you know, there is a, a element of COVID that plays into this, to this story as well. Mm -hmm. and uh, drugs and uh, stroke and Alzheimer's and diabetes. You know, it's the, it's the stuff that your group knows really well. And nitric oxide uh, has some mechanistic, mechanistic activity in each one of these diseases. And this is the idea. And again, I um, just, to, just to let people know how serious some of these physicians are about this. Again, I contributed a chapter into this integrative cardiovascular medicine textbook that was, um, that was edited, uh, Mark Houston was the uh, organizer and editor of this and uh, Nathan Bryan, who's the, who wrote this 
nitric oxide nutrition book. He wrote a chapter in this book as well. And I, so I've had a chance to rub shoulders with him a little bit and talk about this science and, you know, it's out there and we can measure it. We just have to look closely uh, for like you're looking at your, you know, your patients on these blood screens. So it's, it's, it's really quite interesting. Uh, on the next slide, we talk about uh, how it's such an important molecule. Why it's hard to measure, it's the gas. It comes and goes almost instantly. So you need a common supply of it. And where we typically get it is, uh, is from the foods we eat. Uh, however, you know the typical American diet, you know, we might not have the kind of foods that are the ideal precursors for nitric oxide. And we'll talk about that. Also, we learn that as we age, it's not made by part of our body. It's made in the mouth and it's made in our blood vessels. But as we age, we don't, we stop making it or we don't make it as efficiently as we age. And that kind of makes sense. People might understand that. And they also now have figured out how to reverse the process or how to augment the lack of it to uh, undo some of those effects. And before we get into the weeds forward on this whole process, I have had some patients with Renaud's, you know, Renaud's, which is a yep. constriction of the periphery vessels. And they have told me they've had remarkable change after just taking a supplement. And we'll, and we'll decide if a supplement's right for you or not right for you, because there's ways we can measure it. So as we move ahead, I just want to maybe get to the two ways we make it. One of the ways we make it is in the endothelium. The endothelium is a manufacturer through this, call it the ENOS arginine pathway. And Ford, maybe I'll just let you take that little part a little bit and tell me what the, this ENOS arginine pathway is about. Sure. There's an enzyme and it's called ENOS. It's, a, it's like so many things in science. It's a, uh, an acronym. It stands for endothelial nitric oxide synthase. Um, so that, uh, that enzyme takes uh, precursors like L-arginine and citrulline. Remember, we mentioned those earlier, and those are a couple of my most popular videos um, for this reason, because of that topic. It takes those, those precursors and forms nitric oxide with those. And again, that gets us back to the whole nitric oxide story. Yeah, and so, and so a couple things that were mentioned in Nathan's book is that as we age, we lose our ability to make it. So that's a big concern. The other concern are the large population of people that have a mutation of the MTHFR gene. And that can be found out pretty easily. And I know you've done some work on that, Ford, but I don't know where you are on that particular um, that particular story. It's a great point. It's also a supplementation story as well. Over half of us have some significant uh, inability to methylate, and it's methylation. Many people recognize this term by the term methylation. Just very briefly, another quick bunny hole, and uh, we'll go down it for a few minutes. <laughs> So oxidation, you, the difference between us and, uh, and yeast is that yeast can't really oxidize uh, glucose, for example. It gets six units of oxygen out of glucose. We, have, we are able to get 36 units of, of energy out of glucose compared to the six that the yeast to get. Why? Because we carry oxygen, hemoglobin. We oxidize things. Now, another, the chemists, you know, the, the engineers, the mechanics will call oxidation rust. It's combination of oxygen with iron classically, but um, in our body, we use oxidation to pull energy out of a molecule like a glucose molecule or a fat molecule. And that's how we're able to get so much more energy. But you know, it's like any other very effective uh, way of burning and creating energy. It's like, um, like a furnace. And in fact, one of the most common uh, theories about aging is the mitochondria theory. The mitochondria are considered the furnaces of the cell. Well, if you've got a cell, a furnace, and exact, that's exactly where this occurs. In the mitochondria, you have this oxidation process. 
Uh, heart cells, for example, may have, uh, I, I forgot what it is, maybe thousands, hundreds to thousands of mitochondria per cell, whereas other cells that don't use a lot of uh, energy, like some bone cells, cartilage cells, things like that, have less than a dozen. Um, <clears throat> that's the furnace. That's where the energy is derived for use of the cell. Well, have you ever looked at a new furnace and compared it to a 60-year-old furnace? 60-year-old furnaces have holes in them. The iron has been uh, oxidized or rusted out in a lot of places, and they just don't work as well. Now, what, why did I go down all that bunny hole when, when Doug started talking about methylation? Well, it has to do, to do with the basic chemistry. The opposite of oxidation is reduction. Reduction is adding a hydrogen item or I, I, we don't really do that. M medically, in, in terms of our bodies as humans, we add an entire methyl, which is a carbon plus three or four hydrogens. We don't add one hydrogen, we add a methyl group. Now it's beginning to complete the circle. Uh, there are uh, enzymes that we use in our metabolism to clean up all of that oxidation, all of the burnout rust that's created by our energy deriving mechanisms. It has to do with reduction, which in our world, our metabolism is actually accomplished through methylation. Um, the simple way, you know, Doug mentioned you can get tests for this. Um, the simple way to deal with this is to take a methylated uh, B vitamin complex because the B vitamins are the vitamins that are very much involved with that. Doug, I do have a, um, a methylated B vitamin complex that I, uh, that I offer. Uh, it's more of a medical grade. It's, a, uh, it's got a little bit higher level of one of the, uh, the, meth the, B, the B vitamins. So I think that's probably enough to cover on that. Any other comments before we move on? No, I just think that, you know, we learned that if you have this MTHFR mutation, that uh, it also impairs your ability to make nitric oxide cleanly. So there were, so there were really two things. There, were, there was age, and then there was a genetic uh, component that could be uh, preventing uh, proper uh, production as well. And then the next pathway uh, is very interesting, and this is where, um, where I come in. Um, the next pathway. Yep. Actually, let me, pardon me, but let me interrupt and say one more thing. If you listen to some other YouTube docs, specifically Z Dog MD, he'll say, yes, methylation exists, but it doesn't matter. Well, it doesn't matter to somebody like him. He's a hospitalist, an intensivist. He's dealing with people in the intensive care. Mm -hmm. But if you look at the science, that's not at all true. People like myself and the other over 50% of the population that have a methylation problem, we start getting problems earlier. Tissue breakdown, for example, uh, uh, problems with our eyes associated with methylation and, and early prediabetes. So it is a serious issue. There, the science is very clear about it. And as you've mentioned, yes, I've covered that in some other areas. Thanks for, the, for taking the interruption. And this is the other area that I find very fascinating, and I've learned about it recently, but it comes from our diet. And it's the story about how dietary nitrates um, become turned into nitrites as the saliva in the teeth start to chew up the food. And that nitrate, some of that nitrite is immediately converted by healthy bacteria that live on the tongue. And so what you see on the slide is a plate of green leafy vegetables and some foods. It mixes with the bacteria in the tongue and the saliva, which is the first phase of digestion. And then some of it gets made into nitric oxide right then and there. But the other nitrite gets absorbed uh, by the body. Uh, and what it usually takes is some appropriate stomach acid. So for later on in our discussion, this would be a place to discuss people who take PPIs or antacids if yeah. you don't have the right stomach acid. And then it gets reabsorbed into our system and it sits up in the parotid gland. And it sits up in the parotid gland as nitrite rich solution that immediately squirts out. And now it doesn't have to be chewed. 
doesn't have to be digested and the bacteria on the tongue can use it much more readily. So there's a there's an enteral salivary pathway to making nitric oxide and it happens from our commensal organisms, which means our healthy organisms. Now here's the rub for me. When I have somebody that has a gum disease or somebody that has a high cavity rate, we know from doing bacteria studies, if your dentist doesn't do bacteria studies, you'll never know this. But we know from doing bacteria studies that they have a very high disproportion of bad unhealthy bacteria. And what it does is it squelches the healthy commensals anyways. So when I see somebody who's diseased, I know I have to fix the disease or rebalance the disease causing bacteria. And then we can return to this state of health. So in the beginning of my treatment, I'm willing to make some sacrifices um, of some of the bacteria. But in the long term, if I'm healthy and I'm rebalanced, we want to do as little as possible uh, in, in, the, in the mouth. And yeah. so, this is the, so this is this dietary pathway. And it's how it happens, starts on our tongue, continues on in our gut, and then gets resecreted by the parotid glands where the saliva is further broken down into nitric oxide. And the diet pathway gets to be more important as you age because you lose the ability to make it other ways. So that's the idea. So if I could speak to this first bullet under number two, this really has something to do in terms of COVID-19. And here's the issue, and it has something to do with the practical question about should I supplement or should you supplement? Our gut microbiome further converts nitrates to nitrites. However, we need normal stomach acid. With appropriate acid concentration, nitrite, nitrates from fruits, dark green leafy vegetables, and beets get converted to nitrites. Since I have uh, become, I became pre-diabetic, what, five years ago, seven years ago, I started slowing down on fruits because, you know, uh, apple juice, apples, uh, grapes, huge sources of um, fructose and problems for prediabetics. But I practically lived. Dark green leafy vegetables were a major part of my diet until COVID-19. So we've struggled in terms of figuring out, okay, what is a safe, in terms of COVID, way of getting uh, dark green leafy vegetables. And uh, beets is another issue. Beets, as you know, uh, beets are one of the, have been used, sugar beets, you may have heard the term. A lot of those are used as a source of sugar. So uh, understanding that and getting a little bit more focus on that in the age of COVID, I've, uh, I've ordered some, um, some beetroot. Uh, and I am going to be gearing up on that. Doug, as you know, you sent me some of the, some samples on this Neo 40. I've, uh, I've tried that. Not entirely sure how I'll know if it's working, but obviously that's a, that's well, we, yeah, another comment. We can talk about that because we're going to talk about how to measure it. Well, let me ask you this. Are we at a good place for, no, actually, let's go and do, uh, do a couple of more slides and then take a look and see if we need to answer. Yeah, something. maybe one or two more and then we can come back and pick this up. Um, but this was, uh, something else that I just want to remind people. I haven't been on your program for it and talk too much about sleep apnea, but another place that we make nitric oxide, just not to be overlooked is in the paranasal sinuses. And this is one of the reasons why we really encourage people to learn how to nasal breathe and to make sure they can nasal breathe. And it means if they can't nasal breathe, then we want the, an ENT to evaluate and we want to figure that out. But we actually, and I see there's already a question about the oxygen advantage. That's a book that's written about breathing and airway. And we're learning more and more about the airway and the respiration component. I think you talked about respiration a few, uh, a few um, uh, shows ago where we talk about ideal respiration and what we need. And it was part of how COVID affects the lungs. But we need nitric oxide. And we need this uh, uh, to do, to have proper respiration, the CO2 balance. And so it's interesting because the sinuses are very important. And I just want to make sure I go on the record as identifying this as another place where we make nitric oxide. 
and that people use. And we actually encourage lip sealing or mouth taping at night. We could come back and talk about that whole that whole piece. It's another interesting part of dentistry. Yep, uh, you may you may not know. I, I, about two years ago, I did a long series on sleep, and uh, portions of that had to do with sleep disorder, breathing. But there's a lot more to. It's a huge, huge topic in terms of our health. Yeah, and then my friend down the street, uh, Dr. Joel Kahn, he wrote a book called The Whole Heart Solution, and I didn't even put two and two together, but he has a recipe on page 87. It's called Natural Nitrates on a Plate, and I'm like, Joel, why do you have a? I mean, I know you're vegan, and I know that you're, you know, you do a lot of work in this space. But I said, what's the significance of this particular recipe? And he said, this recipe is a nitric oxide producing powerhouse. That's why I have it, you know, on the on the on the slide. So, what I why I'm saying this for it is because, you know, when I listen to your channel, when I work with other professionals, and I become aware of a particular topic or an idea. Uh, all of a sudden, I start to recognize that I've seen it before, or maybe I've heard it before, but it didn't make so much sense to me. So I put this in here um, just in part of being balanced. I mean, we're not the only ones talking about this. And once you start to recognize it, you'll see it around you in, in other places. And so this probably is a good place uh, for to, to, to just throw this concept out there. But no, go ahead. Go ahead with that one slide. If you can go back with that one slide because this is where I felt like I might be doing my patients a disservice. And this is a paper that mentioned, if you don't have the right oral microbiome and you're not producing nitric oxide, could you be affecting someone's blood pressure? And this is now where the endothelium, erectile dysfunction, blood pressure, vascular disease, Renaud's, all these different things start to come into play. And I thought as a dentist, if I could have some simple way of measuring, which I'd love to get to next time, uh, and it's easy, and even for the consumer to be able to do it, it would really lend clarity about should I or should I, shouldn't I, and is what I'm doing having an effect. So this is a big piece because we know how many people have hypertension. We know how many people even on blood pressure medication aren't doing, aren't getting to the end point with their, uh, even just with their medication. And we know that the, uh, this nitric oxide production, oral bacteria, the effect on the system um, may be a contributing factor, especially when I'm trying to get people to go from disease to health. Should I really be doing something for them then during that time when they're maybe most vulnerable? That's the idea. And so when we come back for it and we get into it, we'll look at the literature about systemic hypertension and looking at and managing hypertension and considering the oral microbiome was not even on my radar several years ago. So it's something that I think uh, owes just a little bit of time. So I, I agree. And to, to this point in the middle, in some age groups, the risk of cardiovascular disease doubles for each increment of 20 over 10 millimeters of mercury of blood pressure starting as low as 115 over 75. Uh, you may cover this later. Uh, it, there's a number, something like 10 over 5 in terms of the impact of beets, for example, on blood pressure. Yeah, it's coming up. It's pretty quite interesting. So if, you know, if that can go, double your blood pressure and you can get half of that just by eating beets, yeah, there's got to be something significant there. For so sure. Let's back out just a minute and take a look. I can't see the... Um, the comments when I'm in presentation mode. So let's go back and see what we've got here. Okay. Uh, good morning, Joe Riley. Uh, good morning, Robert Simpson. Dave uh, Murphy. You know, Joe, you know, now that you mention it, Ford, Joe might have reached out to me for a question, and I don't know that I knew how to get a hold of Joe. So maybe if Joe has any, if Joe has any questions, you can help me uh, get to, you know, get to Joe or I can answer them through you. What I will do, uh, Joe and, and uh, Doug, is send both of you a text. That way you'll have each other's mobile phone. Great. Dave Murphy, 98%. Actually, actually go back, Ford. That's an important question. Does that mean don't use CTX4? CTX4, rinse. that stands for carries treatment times four. And that's an oral rinse that is highly uh, virucidal, bactericidal, and uh, fungicidal. So we use it when people have a yeast imbalance, 
when people have a bacteria imbalance and they have maybe a viral imbalance or you're trying to suppress viral expression. It's a great rinse to use and good research behind it. Um, what we don't want to do is I don't think it's necessary to use it if your microbiome is nicely balanced. Some of the people who have used home dental exam, that's what we're looking at is what does that microbiome balance look like? And if you have a lot of high levels of bad acting bacteria, then we do want to use something like this for a while. But we want to eventually maybe get away from it. And we don't want this to be a long term therapeutic, just a maintenance option. We want something that's a lot softer and kinder to the microbiome uh, and in maintenance. That means once someone's healthy. It's, it's a good point. It reminds me of the whole question of antibiotics. When, um, oh, I'm blanking on the guy's name that discovered, um, that discovered penicillin. Louis Pasteur. No, uh, I don't think so. Uh, I'll probably remember it about three hours from now. <laughs> you will. <laughs> Mommy, somebody can, uh, can Google it real quick and fact, fact check us. But when he did, it ushered in, it was a miracle. It ushered in a revolution in medicine. So people, you know, even what, a hundred years later, um, it, say, well, you know, if it's a good thing. Doc, I got a sore throat. Give me some antibiotics. That's one of the biggest challenges in medicine. Yeah. And here's the thing. Uh, <laughs> You use them at the wrong time, you use them too much, and microscopically your body becomes the equivalent of post-apocalypse. It's like, um, it, it, you know, these post-apocalyptic uh, movies like, uh, oh, blanking on Thunderdome. <laughs> that. I mean, it's like nothing's growing anymore, and it becomes a big, big issue and not a great place to live. So. Uh, same thing with you. It, it, the question becomes, when is it appropriate to use these things? And when are you creating a post-apocalyptic uh, problem for your, for your oral biome? Right. Dave Murphy, 98%, 55 uh, beats per minute. So Dave, if you, get a, if you get an upper respiratory infection or a flu, and then your, uh, your uh, O2 sat starts dropping into the 80s, you know, you've got an issue. Thanks for sharing. Uh, Joe's 96% and 61 beats per minute. Don't forget to like the video. Thank you again, David. Appreciate that. Yeah, that uh, video is pretty funny. It's hard not to like. It's, it's funny. <laughs> I think he was talking about our video. Oh, good. I'm, I'm not worried about Amy's video. I'm sure she's getting <laughs> plenty of likes. Uh, Goat Sim Regan. Oxygen Advantage. Yeah, that's a book. That's a book. Um, that's uh, well, that's the title of a book. I I'm not sure if that's what he's referring to, but that's the title of a book that's uh, written by Pat McEwen. Um, that is a nice read about the significance of good air exchange and good oxygen, uh, especially uh, for sleep and sleep apnea. So James Cantor, I had a kidney stone, kidney stone recently trying to get eat a low oxalate diet. Can I still have beetroot powder? I don't know the answer to that. Do you, Doug? No, I don't. I, I do have a personal story <laughs> to share. Um, I had a, a kidney stone. It was my first half marathon. I uh, ran through the horse park uh, here in Lexington, Kentucky. Beautiful half marathon. And then all of a sudden, I felt like one of the, it was about an hour later. <laughs> I felt like one of those horses had kicked me right in the back. And then I started vomiting. You know, that's classic uh, for history for a kidney stone. I began to wonder. It. Six weeks later, I still had that kidney stone. I had seen a couple of urologists. They uh, failed to diagnose it. I ended up seeing, because of I was going into meetings with pain at the University of Kentucky, the dean walked by, saw me sitting, sweating, sent me over to get an MRI. Yes, I've had, I had a kidney stone. So had to have two procedures to, and a couple of stents to get rid of it. It was interesting. So the after, the after story was I was discussing that with my mom, and I said, you know, we never had any, you know, there's a, a genetic component to this. And we never had anybody with kidney stones. And she said, oh, well, funny you should mention, you had an uncle 
in his 30s, and he got sick like that and died a week later. Oh, no. <laughs> so it's like, oh, my goodness. Uh, I wish I'd asked that question because I've been telling these urologists, no, there's none of that in the family. Dave Murphy, working on a waking, working on, on waking up my mitochondria with ketones. Excellent point. Uh, great point. Thanks for sharing it, Dave. And yes, um, ketones are a great way to to change all of that and make a uh, make a big difference in terms of your energy metabolism. Jake Carey, uh, Junior Carey Thomas, what about nitrites nitrates in bacon? Well, what you hear about nitrates in bacon is all bad. You know, I never connected those dots. I don't know if you did, Doug, or not. You have to wonder. Yeah, we know those meats aren't the best thing for you from uh, for a number of other reasons, but uh, the nitrates in bacon work. <clears throat> you know, they get converted too. So it's not only from plants, but it's from any foods that have nitrates. They'll get converted to nitrites and, uh, and it'll get used. Very interesting connection. Never connected those dots. Thanks. And uh, Joe Riley's uh, giving a thumbs up. I think, again, a reminder, folks, if you will... Uh, <clears throat> Give us a thumbs up. The uh, If you're getting value from the show, obviously, uh, give us a thumbs up. Share it on, on social media. When you do that, the algorithm reads that. And if you're interested in, in uh, helping get these messages out, heart attack, stroke, how to prevent it, better health, uh, these are some of the ways that you can contribute to it. Mm -hmm. uh, Joe Riley, I have a bottle of it and toothpaste. Mm -hmm. I think he may be talking about that. Uh, that <clears throat> yeah, he might be talking about the CTX4 rinse. Don Jones, thoughts on I, Ion Biome nasal spray used to be restored. Yeah, I'm not familiar, uh, Don, with the Io Biome nasal spray. Most of the nasal sprays that we recommend have a xylitol base. It would be a little bit antifungal, antibacterial, um, and it would be uh, healthy for the healthy for the, the nasal uh, passages. Also the saline, you know, the concentrated saline and know Ford, you've done, um, you've done the program on that where we can get some hypochlorous acid production. But I don't know about IO biome. I'm just, I, ion biome. I'm just not familiar with that particular uh, brand of spray. I'm not either. And thank you all yeah, for coming. time. <laughs> Fleming, Alexander Fleming, wasn't it? Yeah, I think so. Sir Alexander Fleming, exactly. <laughs> he must have gotten knighted as a result of that hard work with that. Speaking of fungus, that's where it came from. <laughs> Red mold, dieting with a life. What about aloe vera juice as a mouth rinse? I used to keep oral lichen planus in check, use it to keep that in check. So it kills bacteria, but how harsh? Yeah, not very harsh. Uh, dieting with a life, not very harsh. I think uh, the aloe vera is a nice moisturizing gel, plant-based, obviously. Um, the, I will tell you one that I really do like out there that's plant-based. And again, I have no financial interest in anything that we talk about on this show as far as other than my home dental exam. I have no financial interest. But Stella Life makes a very nice biobotanical rinse. This would be something that I would support as a general purpose daily rinse if you're healthy. Uh, I think that's a nice thing to do. Or if you had some kind of oral condition like, you know, maybe the odd canker sore or, um, or lichen, plan or, lichen planus or some other uh, light autoimmune issue that flares up from time to time, the Stella Life product would be really, really nice. That's a newer product on the block and it's a great product. They have a nice, I think it's called Vega Care. They have a nice oral rinse product, all plant-based. So, Carl, you may want to take those uh, those uh, signs down for a few minutes. <laughs> Cynthia, Cynthia LCO01. I'm Scottish and can confirm it's Fleming. Thank you so much. At yeah, least I'm not the best historian. I appreciate all the help. <laughs> <laughs> Pasteur was uh, pasteurizing milk. Bill Boswell, Fleming. BP 128 over 79. There you go, Joe. That's uh, you. Your target's a little bit lower, but we've we've shared Joe's story multiple times on the channel. Joe has uh, shared with the with the viewers and subscribers that he's got and and has worked with a couple of genetic uh, challenges in terms of 
world-class levels of both FH, mm -hmm. familial hypercholesterolemia, and LP little a. We're talking 800, 900, over 1,000 kind of values in these areas. And it's like, Joe's still doing a great job. Still, uh, obviously, um, shared that he had, he had seen me. We've done a lot of work with his, uh, with his, uh, his challenges. He's one of those folks that uh, did take the PCSK9s. And he, he also shared that he's one of those guys that did want to decrease his... Uh, his cholesterol levels, got his LDL levels down into the 20s and was happy with that. That creates a whole new set of debates, which we're not going to get into today. <laughs> but thank you again, Joe, for sharing. Uh, Karen Black, Dr. Thompson, can you remind us of the mouthwash you recommend? I think it had iodine or hydrogen peroxide. Yeah, one of the ones, and Karen, what I would want you to do is I don't want you to use anything. If you're healthy and you have normal uh, pathogenic versus healthy bacteria levels, you don't really need to use anything unless you just want some fresh breath. Then I would use a mint, a xylitol mint or something like that. Um, but the mouth rinse, one of the ones that we're using, and if you hear a little background noise from my uh, microphone feed, it's because I'm in an active dental office. We're starting back seeing patients on Monday in, in Michigan here. And uh, I have some team members in getting things ready to go. But we're... Um, the uh, mouthwash that we're using as a pre-rinse for patients before we see them is one from IOTech company, I-O-T-E-C-H, and they make a ready-to-use iodine based. It's called molecular iodine, so it's different than povidone iodine, but it's a very um, antiviral, uh, antibacterial, 30 seconds. Again, this would be somewhat on the level of CTX4 rinse, which is pretty harsh, so if you didn't have any issues, I would go back to a plant-based general all-purpose rinse, something that's easy to use, soothing, kind to the tissues. If you have a little bit of dry mouth or you snore at night and you're dry in the morning, this is something you could use. But again, no harsh mouth rinses if you're healthy. James Cantor, on the list of low oxalate diet is to avoid spinach and beets is on the uh, list again. Yeah, James, I, those are great questions. Again, as a uh, fellow kidney stone uh, victim or patient, uh, it's a really good question. I can tell you, I personally have not avoided spinach. That's been a major part of my diet up till, as we said, up till the COVID-19 issue. I, I, can, I'm, can, I continue to consider whether or not we should just do a lot more uh, uh, frozen spinach, but I hate frozen spinach. <laughs> I just hate it. <laughs> Black, super sticker, uh, three bucks. Thank you so much, Karen. And while we're mentioning it, Joe uh, Riley gave a five dollar super super sticker as well. We appreciate that, and so did uh, Dave Murphy. Guys, uh, again, it means so much to, to see you guys go ahead and just contribute <clears throat> out of your own pocket to get this information out there. Thank you so much. We will um, go back to. Crispin, Dave in Florida here. Thanks for this topic. Nitric oxide is the undisclosed issue I've been waiting to hear about. Uh, thanks for acknowledging that. You know, it's it's difficult to know. You watch the the views on a on a topic, and sometimes you don't. When this topic comes up, you don't know if it's because of the ED component. You don't know if it's because of citrulline. Because citrulline, one of the biggest uh, viewer components on my citrulline videos are guys that work out, weightlifters, because they feel like they get a massive pump uh, when, they're, when they're using citrulline. Again, for the same reasons that it dilates their arteries so they can get more, more blood to them. Joe, how would you address, or would you address Electrolux, water for sterilizing food salads? Uh, Doug, you're actually using a similar component. You want to make a quick comment about that? And Joe, I, I do, uh, I do hear you. I haven't gotten there yet. Uh, it's one of those items that I'm curious about. Yeah, there's makers that make electrolyzed water, but basically what it does is you use salt and vinegar and a little bit of what you use water with a little bit of uh, salt and vinegar and it splits the chlorine atom off the NACL and it puts free chlorine in the water. 
And this is very, uh, very nice disinfectant because it's just like water. You could drink it. You could put it on surfaces. It won't corrode. And we're actually using that in very nice misters. And, and this is something that's now totally uh, this question oriented, but there's a company called Cloudburst and Cloudburst makes a very nice little pump sprayer with a brass nozzle on it that puts a very, very fine mist out. And actually Cloudburst for it is the company that invented the athlete misters that you see on the sidelines when the athletes are getting cooled off. And so you make this electrolyzed water um, uh, Ecotech Corporation has a nice little maker, a uh, couple hundred bucks, and you can make electrolyzed water, 100 parts per million chlorine, and put it in a little atomizer, and you can use it to disinfect all kinds of things. And uh, we use that in between patients and uh, disinfect hard to clean surfaces. So uh, I will tell you this, Doug, uh, later on, Dave Murphy's got suggest had a great suggestion. He said, would you mind sharing links to uh, the products that you've listed today. And if you will, we'll put them down under the video. Mm -hmm. Sure. Great, great suggestion, Dave. I'll just say one other thing. As many of you know, I'm spending almost half of my time now uh, working with large employers, helping them get their employees back to work mm -hmm. here in the age of COVID. One of the things that we do as a companion item is deal with the environments within that employer workspace. Nitrous oxide is a big deal. We're using that a lot in that area for cleaning up that environment. So yes, it's just, you're seeing it everywhere. And, and Doug, if you have, have a link for that um, cloudburst technology, that would be I do. Great. Yep. Now we get this, you know, we get a lot of these recurring conversations and uh, one of them has to do with instruments. Joe Riley mentioned he was a professional trombonist with uh, the army band for, decades, I believe. Uh, Ralph Alexander Lydon is a, 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 what is it, sax girl? Um, can't remember the rest of that, that ID, but all talking about wind instruments and the plume associated with COVID-19. That's a big deal these days. Note on brass instruments, German researchers seem to think most wind instruments do not generate a plume <laughs> larger than the normal exhale but keep your distance from flute <laughs> and singers. <laughs> Dave Murphy, thanks to, to both you and me, Doug. Thank you so much, Dave. I appreciate the, uh, the statement and the, the contribution. And that's that request about yeah. that. It's a good idea. Claudette P, can I remember the name of the nitric oxide test that you now use in the dental office for patients? Yeah, I do a couple things, Claudette. Um, I have, uh, on our Wellness Dentistry Network lab panel, we have ADMA, which gives me a tip. But if you're not going to do blood work or something like that, uh, through physicians, you can get some other measurables of endothelial dysfunction. So any patient with endothelial dysfunction would be fair game to, um, to supplement. Uh, the other way you could do it is human, H-U-M-A-N-N, -N, human N. They make a little nitric oxide test indicator strip. That's kind of that's kind of cool. You can take a little pool of saliva and you can dip the test strip in it. It's like pH paper, and you can look at it and see if it's optimal. I'm actually having patients look at their nitric oxide level now when they're in periodontal management. So patients with gum disease management, I want to know: Can you make it? What's the indicator strip say? And if the indicator strip says you're making it fine, I leave you alone. If we not making it, then we want to try to replenish it. So those are a couple ways. There's other ways we can get some measurements in collaboration with our physicians. Uh, things like endopat, um, the other thing like uh, uh, pulse wave analysis for some of those things. So I'm smiling, Doug, because I saw that. it's reminded, reminding me of what happened yesterday. I called Todd. Here's where this bunny hole is going. So, you know, Todd and I wrote a book and Todd has a component of his CIMT program where he does vascular functional testing, including the things that you're talking about. And we, again, we go into the science on how it requires, like CIMT, these things require some very rigid, very robust quality systems to get, to get readable numbers on it. I called Todd because we've talked about this book several times on these videos. 
he and I have gone back and forth. Co-authoring is a nightmare. I called him yesterday and I said, Todd, I sent you this uh, uh, over a month ago. And he said, I thought I sent it back to you immediately. <laughs> so somebody was asking me, when is that thing coming out? I have to tell you, I don't know. Todd, <laughs> Todd and I had that same discussion yesterday. We we're both a little bit frustrated. Bottom line is if we'd put it out two months ago, it would have gotten totally washed out with COVID news anyway. So hopefully we're getting closer. Todd's committed to looking at it today, checking his outbox and making sure that we're there. We are on the last draft. And again, it covers the science behind the tests that we're talking about here, the endothelial tests, endopat, uh, vascular functioning testing. And, and Ford, the reason why I brought this to you is because when I started to look at the different chapters, even in the integrative cardiovascular medicine textbook, I kept seeing all these little nips at this whole topic. And so, uh, you know, there's, there's something here, um, you know, is it as big as, you know, a great diet? I, I don't know, but I know that there's something here that we need to pay attention to. There is. There really is. And there's a place for vas uh, vascular functional testing. There clearly is. Again, you just have to be careful on how you manage the quality for it and how you interpret it. And again, if we can ever get that darn book out, we'll share some of that information. And so back to Claudette's question. Sometimes it's just one test, but sometimes Claudette, I like to look at a uh, very, I'm trying to get correlation between different tests to create the whole picture. So dieting with a life. Uh, great, op great opportunity for me to do some self-disclosure and some uh, self-awareness here. Why no spinach with COVID-19? Because I'm nervous about it. I'm one of these, as you may have noticed, I'm not the only one. Farmers are, you know, it's, it's awful. They're having to bury food products, and that includes both the animal side and the vegetable side. You know, so whether you're a vegan or or carnivore or whatever you are, it's, it's awful what's going on in the food, um, the food chain side. But, and we've also, Janice and I have both acknowledged that we're a little bit hyper, maybe too hyper. Again, we're not alone, but uh, we used, I used to spend a lot of my time over in the fresh products uh, aisle, the fresh vegetables aisle, getting stuff like spinach, fresh cauliflower, broccoli, uh, Brussels sprouts, and we're just still a little bit nervous about that. Are we correct? Hmm, maybe not. Uh, we were also way too nervous about doing uh, uh, takeout food. And we've loosened up a little bit on that. I'm sure as this thing continues to grind on, maybe it's gonna wear us out and we're gonna start getting back into fresh vegetables. I, I have to tell you, I'm getting close to my, to my end on that issue as well. Uh, Junior Kerry Thomas, Alexander Fleming, thank you so much. See, I told you, Doug, these guys are smarter than we are. Oh, yeah. Just listen. Just We've that. learned something. Uh, good vibes from Brian Fegan. Uh, are you guys going over to go over supplements? I have a patient in 10 minutes. Yeah, and Dino, we'll go, you know, we'll get into that even more next time forward when we talk. But yeah, there is a there is a supplement. There's a reason why I like that. I like the one. I mean, there's probably many out there for you can. Uh, address that, but you already showed the Neo 40 professional. Yeah. And, uh, the professional just means it has something in there for the people that have MTHFR mutations and it has more of some of the beet products. But I think there's quite a few different products out on the market that might do this. And hey, if you can, you know, if you replenish it, uh, you use whatever works. I mean, so if you're going to replenish nitric oxide, the big thing is just measure it or find out about it. Just like the bacteria in your mouth, just measure them and find out about them and then you can decide what to do. Given how time works, I'm 90% I'm sure Dino has already gone back to his patient, but he he has, I'm, I'm still gonna make a couple of comments here. Uh, the first one is, here are the components of this. It's of uh, this Neo 40. Uh, vitamin C, 100 milligrams, B12, 50 micrograms, folate, 400 micrograms, and proprietary nitric oxide blend, beetroot powder, hawthorn berry extract, citrulline and sodium nitrite. So uh, here's, here's some of the, I, I'll get to the bottom line on some of my perspective on it. And I can't tell you it's right, it's just my perspective. 
I do a different vitamin C and I do a lot more than 100 milligrams. Yeah, I do. I have a restore me that proprietary blend of methylated B vitamins, which has a lot more B12 in it. It's got a gram of methylated folate in it. So it's a very different, it covers that source much better than Neo 40. I also have a, um, a beetroot powder, specific beetroot powder with more than 400 micro, uh, milligrams in that. So <clears throat> I have a different set of solutions for supplementation for nitric oxide. Yeah. But I also have a, a, another perspective. So I don't, I don't know how much this is. Doug, do you? Yeah, it's not inexpensive. Uh, I think it's yeah. about um, my, you, it's probably in the ninety to one hundred dollar a month range to buy enough of that to take. Depends on how many a day you're taking. Um, but what we're going to show next time is there's actually a study that shows this could lower, uh, could have an effect on CIMT thickness. And guys mm -hmm. like me that are struggling with CIMT thickness over the years. Um, I want to see what the six month effect is. So if there's a way we could put other things together to make the same effect, I'm good with that. Yeah. That's and, what I'm going to say. And I will tell you my, that, that includes all of these and a lot better is a little bit less than half of that. And that's because it's that much because we're doing that restore me, which is a major methylated folate. If you go with, even the even still the methylated brands uh, like um, uh, Thorn uh, methylated B vitamin complex, um, you it's like a quarter of the cost that you're talking about to cover a whole bunch of these areas and to cover them a lot better. Sure. So, so Doug sent me the research, which these guys are handing out to the dental community. And I looked at those research and I compare that to the, the actual ingredients that I just talked about. And I think you can get a lot better um, combination. I'm not saying don't use it, I'm just saying that's my, my reaction to it. Here's the other reaction I want to make, and that is you can't supplement, supplement your way out of a bad lifestyle. Yeah, and that's true. So many, so many people want to take a supplement for this and uh, sort of ignore the 30 pounds of body fat that they have that's driving everything in the wrong direction and will mow over any kind of supplement. So thanks for uh, allowing me to go on my soapbox about that issue. Uh, Joe Riley, how do you get two piccolo players in, to stay in tune for the Stars and Stripes solo? <laughs> I think Joe's answering that. I think it comes up. Uh, well, it, obviously, it's not a solo at that point. Yeah. Ever used uh, anodyne? I, I haven't. Have you? No. Uh, no, I'm not familiar with what that is. So <laughs> Joe's response was shoot one of them and then have a solo. <laughs> I, I was in high school band, Doug. I don't know if you heard me share that at one point. I was yeah. actually all state bassoonist. I was uh, playing bassoon for eight hours a day for a whole summer. And you can imagine how much my family appreciated that. Jim D, very, very late. Sorry, Doc. How do you, uh, Dino Manis, how do you get it? Yeah, Dino, that's uh, that's human. Uh, same <laughs> same company that makes the test strip will make that. So you could go and get that there. We'll add it to the list. Last comment from Dr. Kevin McCord, a good uh, prevention doc up yeah. in uh, just south of Cincinnati. And I didn't know you were uh, Scottish, Kevin. Uh, he says, I'm just wondering if you think that bagpipes play the full blast produce a COVID-19 aerosol hazard. Well, I forgot to tell, well, I did tell you uh, a few weeks ago, I used to play bagpipes. So uh, as you can see, that's probably very good, very good training for um, for you two. It's a hot, uh, hot bag of wind. <laughs> but the, the thing is, I do... So, when, I will tell you this, uh, the I don't think bagpipes are really going to submit that much of a plume. You've got four or five different, you've got three drums up here, then you've got the, the playing pipe beneath, and those are the only places where air come out. Uh, I would agree with the comment we had earlier. Singing and flautists both are going to create much more of a flume than most of the other instruments. Uh, 
So we're playing on that, uh, on Joe's joke there. Ken Carrillo, Dr. B, your mic fell off. I'm wondering if they can't hear me. Anyhow, we're we can, we can we can we can hear you, but there was a change in the sound. So maybe your mic on your lapel, um, or however you're mic'd up. I didn't have that mic. I didn't have my lapel mic. Here's what I, actually I've got a great mic these days. If you can see that, yeah, that's a nice one. I don't use any of them for these. <laughs> 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 and that's a whole nother story. Very long. One. Thank you so much for. Uh, for your interests, actually, we do have one more. Can a person with hyperparathyroid thyroidism take nitric oxide supplement? I don't know the answer to that. Thank you very much for your interest, uh, guys. We're gonna. Doug has to go back to work and get his dental office ready to start seeing patients. Yeah, thank and you. I gotta help people get back to work. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye.